I'm your host, Anna Delino, and welcome to episode 3 of the Crime Bistro Podcast. This show gazes into the thrillingly twisted world of true crime, examining real cases while we share in a passion for crime and coffee alike. For this episode, I am enjoying an iced almond milk latte, so grab yourself a fresh brew and let's get into the conspiracy of the death of Princess Diana. Diana Frances Spencer was born July 1st of 1961, and she was the youngest daughter of British nobles Joan Spencer and Frances Shant. There has always been this misconception surrounding Diana that she was a commoner who was swept up into the world of royalty, but her family actually grew up really close with the royals, and they had been close for generations, and her family was extremely wealthy as well. She grew up in a huge mansion with her three siblings. She had two sisters named Sarah and Jane, and then a younger brother named Charles. And she did have another brother named John, who died when he was an infant, unfortunately, and this was the year before she was born. Diana's parents divorced when she was about seven years old, which understandably was really difficult for her. This is a very young age. And her father got custody of both her and her siblings. Her mom is described as being a bad mother, so the custody arrangement was actually accepted really well by the kids. And she's described her childhood as unhappy and unstable. Despite this, as a kid, she was super creative. She was a really talented piano player. She was also really active, and she participated in swimming and diving. And because her family and the royal family were so close, the royal family allowed them to lease a property on their land. This was on one of the queen's private estates. So like I said before, they grew up very close to the royal family, and they actually grew up playing with the princes. As a kid, Diana would always like to say that she wanted to get married in Kensington Palace, and she actually really liked Charles from a pretty young age and always liked the idea of marrying him. She met Charles when she was 16 years old, and he was actually 29, and at the time, he was dating her older sister, Sarah. Diana started school at Riddlesworth Hall, and in 1974, she went as a boarder to West Heath, which is near Seven Oaks in Kent. She left West Heath in 1977 and attended finishing school at the Institut Alpin Vitaminet in Switzerland. When she was 17 years old and she had finished her finishing school, she moved to London and she moved into a flat with seven of her friends. At this time, she took several different low-paying jobs in the area, working as a nanny, as a house cleaner, and also as a hostess. And it was in the summer of 1980 that Prince Charles started showing interest in Diana, and they started dating. Immediately, the paparazzi took interest in the relationship, and the relationship moved very quickly. It's important to mention that the royal family keeps a very close watch over their image, and who a royal person marries is a very big part of that. They have to have the proper looks and attitude, and they almost have to be approved before a royal wedding is happening. So, while dating Diana, Prince Charles was essentially in love with another woman, whose name is Camilla, and this created a lot of tension between Camilla and Diana but Prince Charles decided that Diana was the best fit for the royal family, and he proposed to her in February of 1981. Now, Diana actually didn't agree to this right away. Because she had grown up around the royal family, she knew how difficult it was, how image-focused it was, and just how many different rules and regulations go into being a royal. So she wasn't sure whether or not she actually wanted to be a part of the family, but she did end up accepting the proposal. And there is a lot of debate to this day on whether or not Charles and Diana truly loved each other. Most people think that because Charles was having the ongoing relationship with Camilla, he was never really in love with her, and that Diana really did have true feelings for him. That would be at least at this point in the relationship. The marriage did go downhill after the ceremony very quickly. There is an interview clip that has become really famous where Charles is saying that he is in love with Diana, and then he also says, whatever love means. So this is the day that they actually announced the engagement, and Diana had spoken about this. Um, she referred to the incident afterwards as traumatizing and devastating, which is completely understandable. And she claims that he has said this to her privately as well. And it is possible that he said this on the air just so that Camilla wouldn't think he was truly in love with Diana, which I think is actually very likely. Nevertheless, all eyes were on the couple, and a big royal wedding at this point hadn't happened in many years, and people really started to flock to Diana. People really loved her. 
She was the first English woman to marry an heir to the throne for 300 years since Anne Hyde married the future James II, and she wasn't considered to be a standard royal family member pretty much from the beginning. She was the first woman that actually held a job before marrying into the family, and she was described as being very strong-willed, as well as very honest and very genuine. The wedding took place on July 29th of 1981, and it was viewed by over 750 million people, becoming the most viewed event of all time just in front of the moon landing. And the idea of Diana being kind of an atypical royal family member was pretty much confirmed on the wedding day by the fact that she had the vows changed before the wedding, having the word obey removed from them, and this was a very big deal at the time. With Diana choosing to go against the grain a little bit, however, from the beginning, it did seem like the royal family was becoming increasingly concerned with the image that she was portraying to the public because it wasn't one that was necessarily approved by them. The wedding made Diana the Princess of Wales and also the third highest ranking woman in the royal family after Queen Elizabeth and then Queen Elizabeth's mother, and she was only 20 years old at the time. She quickly also became the most famous woman in the royal family. The paparazzi took a huge interest in her, and whenever she and Charles would go out, people would be screaming for Diana and not for Charles, and all of the attention would always be right on her. She was known as the People's Princess, and people thought that she was really relatable, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that she did hold a job before marrying into the royal family. The pressure to have an heir was applied almost immediately after the wedding, and Diana had Prince William first in 1982, afterwards giving birth to Prince Harry in 1984. And Diana also showed herself to be unique as a royal mother. She was the one who chose her children's names, which apparently was not standard practice. She also hired her own nanny because she didn't like the one the royal family had chosen, but she actually didn't end up using this nanny a lot. She was a very hands-on mother. And this led to people liking her even more because people saw that she was a really involved and pretty relatable mother. But the royal family was irritated by her behavior, and it became clear that they almost wanted her to shrink her personality. Diana was very famous for her outreach and charity work, and one of the most impactful things she did while she held her title was during the AIDS crisis. She was actually one of the first people to shake hands with someone who had AIDS and have it photographed. And she did this to prove that that wasn't how the disease was spread. She was also a heavy advocate for people who suffered with mental illnesses. And during her marriage, Diana was actually president or patron of over 100 different charities, which is amazing. However, despite her popularity, the media also tended to scrutinize Diana. And even when negative stories would come out about her, they were never denounced by the royal family, and she was never really offered any public relations protection or any kind of support from them. This was very overwhelming and really isolating for her, on top of the fact that her life was heavily controlled by royal family protocols, she didn't even feel accepted by them, and she really started to struggle in the position that she was in. In her own words, the royal family would, quote, be there to criticize, but never be there to say well done, end quote, which I can't even imagine how difficult that would be, especially on a young mother. She was very depressed during this time. As a royal and also in her marriage, she experienced bulimia that she said was caused by Prince Charles's comments about her body. And the royals, again, did not like that Diana was openly talking about her mental health struggles. They didn't want to portray the image that a royal family member could have emotional issues or really any kind of issue outside of their perfect image that they have been trying to create. And just to add to the struggles that Diana was having at this time, Charles apparently reconnected with Camilla at some point during the marriage, which Diana found out about and confronted him. And when she did confront him about the affair, he said that he didn't want to be the only Prince of Wales who had never had a mistress, which is awful. Diana has said that the way Prince Charles acted towards her during the marriage constantly made her feel inadequate, and the affair likely made this just so much worse. Around the same time, she started an affair of her own with an actor named D James Hewitt. Now, there has been some speculation that James Hewitt is actually Harry's real father. They do look very similar, and James Hewitt notably has red hair as well. The affair is believed to have started about 18 months before Harry was born and continued throughout that time period. 
So it is possible, but it's highly likely that this won't ever be confirmed. The marriage was clearly heading in a negative direction, though, and their separation was officially announced in 1992, though they didn't get divorced just yet. In November of 1995, Diana gave an exclusive interview to the BBC, and this interview since has become really, really famous. She was incredibly open about the loneliness that she experienced both in her marriage and as a royal and how unhappy she had become with her life. Most notably, she spoke really openly about both her affair and Charles's affair, and the public responded really well to this interview by Diana. They actually didn't really seem to care that she had cheated on Charles, but it really hurt uh, Charles's reputation as the opposite effect, and the family's reputation really took a hit after this. And it was about a month after the interview was released that the Queen advised Diana and Charles to get a divorce. I say advised in quotes. And Diana released her own statement regarding the divorce, which further upset the royal family because they really wanted to regain control of the narrative over this relationship. Their divorce was officially settled in August of 1996, and in the terms of the divorce, Diana actually lost her title of Her Royal Highness. And there has since been a lot of conflict about this. Some people believe that the Queen wanted her title taken away and that Charles didn't really care for her keeping it. And other people believe that Charles was the one who didn't want her to keep it and that the Queen didn't really care. But either way, losing the title was really upsetting for Diana, and she thought people wouldn't take her seriously anymore. She really wanted to continue with her public work and a lot of her charity work, and she didn't want this to have any impact on that. Afterwards, Charles went back to Camilla, and the two are actually still together, which the Queen is still pretty upset about. After the divorce, however, Diana started dating Dodi Fayed in the summer of 1997. He was a film producer and also the son of an Egyptian billionaire. Their relationship was officially confirmed to the press on August 7th of 1997, and since Diana had left the royal family, she had still been swarmed by paparazzi constantly throughout her normal daily activities, and the paparazzi became immediately very invested in this relationship and continued to be a constant and overbearing, overwhelming presence in her life. All of this takes us to August 30th of 1997. Paparazzi pressure on this day had been especially bad, and Diana and Dodie were staying at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, which was owned by Dodie's father. They were staying in a special suite that was popular among celebrities. It was a very upscale hotel. Now that day, they actually had ordered two rings from a jewelry store that were delivered to the room, and according to a friend, Dodie was planning on proposing to her that night, which definitely seems likely. They tried to go to dinner, but they were swarmed by paparazzi, and so they decided to return to the hotel. This was around 9.50, and they were going to have dinner at the hotel restaurant, but Dodie actually started to suspect that some of the guests there were reporters in disguise, so he decided that they were just going to eat alone in the suite. Just after midnight, so it was now August 31st, the two decided that they were going to go back to Dodie's apartment. There isn't really a clear reason for this. They made a plan to lose the paparazzi. Diana's security team was going to wait outside the hotel and make it look like they were leaving from the front of the hotel, while Henri Paul, who was the Ritz head of security, would drive the couple to Dodie's apartment after they left from the back door. The group were traveling in a hotel limo, which was a black Mercedes S280. One of Diana's bodyguards also accompanied them. His name was Trevor Reese Jones, and he sat in the passenger seat because he refused to let Diana travel without any kind of security, and Diana and Dodie were both sitting in the back seat. Unfortunately, some paparazzi were still able to find them and follow them, and about five minutes into the drive, at 12.23 a.m., Henri Paul drove the car into the Place d'Alma underpass crashing into the 13th pillar, completely totaling the vehicle, and Trevor was the only person who survived this crash. Notably, he was also the only person in the car who was wearing a seatbelt, so this likely was the action that saved his life. Dodie was thrown from the limo, and his body landed about 20 yards away. 
and Henri Paul likely died instantly on impact as he was the driver. As all of this was happening, the paparazzi who were present in the tunnel did nothing to help Diana or any other passengers in the car. All they did was stand around and take pictures of the scene. And according to a doctor, they were so close to Diana as she was injured that her last words were, Oh my god, leave me alone, leave me alone. Which, if that's true, is just so heartbreaking. Diana had to be cut out of the car with a chainsaw. And at the time, it seems that France responded to emergency situations very differently than we tend to in the States. What they would do is treat people at the scene, making sure they were stable enough to survive an ambulance ride and then would take them to the hospital. So because this was the common practice, Diana actually wasn't transported to the hospital until 1.20 a.m. and the ambulance was stopped twice on the way to the hospital as she suffered from cardiac arrest. So she didn't reach the hospital until 2 o'clock in the morning, and some people reported that the ambulance was only driving about 25 to 30 miles per hour while she was being transported. Once she got there, however, Diana was rushed into surgery, and unfortunately, she later died on the table. She was pronounced dead at 4.01 a.m. at only 36 years old. Her funeral took place on Saturday, September 6th, and it was in Westminster Abbey. And almost immediately, people became pretty suspicious of this accident. Trevor had brain and chest trauma, and he actually broke every single bone in his face, so he was in a coma for about 10 days after the accident. But because he was the only source, people hoped that when he woke up, he would remember something from the accident. Unfortunately, all he remembered was getting into the car at the hotel, which just kind of memory loss is very common for people who have had head traumas or concussions, so it does make sense that he wouldn't remember anything. In the immediate aftermath of the accident, the narrative quickly became that the car had crashed because of the paparazzi in the tunnel, but this changed after the report came back on Henri Paul. French officials concluded that his reckless driving had been what caused the accident. He was driving about 65 miles per hour, and his blood alcohol level was over three times the legal limit. People were really confused about this, however, because he had been working that night, he did go home for a bit because he lived really closely, and he was later called back into work. But when he was called back into work, there is security footage from the hotel of him walking through the lobby before they all got into the car, and he looks totally fine. He doesn't look impaired. You'd think that he would be visually impaired if he had been really that drunk. But there wasn't a lot of evidence collected from the scene. The tunnel was washed with some kind of detergent spray and reopened to the public within 24 hours of the accident happening, which is also a little bit odd. These couple events combined started funneling into the idea that this was a planned accident, and that emerged pretty quickly after it happened, but a full inquest into the crash didn't actually happen for about 10 years afterwards. Intense public pressure led to British officials launching Operation Paget during this time, this was an inquiry into whether there was any truth to the conspiracy theories, and this ran from 2004 to 2008. The inquest ended up blaming the crash on a combination of Henri Paul's drunk driving and the paparazzi presence. He was likely driving so fast because they were being chased, and nine photographers and one motorcycle driver were investigating, were investigated for possibly causing involuntary homicide and also for failing to aid the crash victims. There were three eyewitnesses who reported seeing a bright light flash in the tunnel, and there has been speculation that this light was something that purposely blinded Henri Paul and was placed there by photographers in order to cause the crash. There were two additional people afterwards who came forward to confirm seeing the light that night. However, the British inquest determined that the bright light had never happened based on the fact that it hadn't blinded any other drivers in the tunnel and that it had only caused one accident. It has also been speculated that a white Fiat hit the back of the limousine and pushed it into the pillar, proceeding to speed away. There was a couple who came forward with this information saying that the Fiat had almost hit them as well as it was driving away from the scene. 
This has been corroborated by white paint found on the side mirror and also on the bumper of the limo, and pieces of plastic matching the Fiat were found in the wreckage. Apparently, French investigators looked for the Fiat for two years with no success, but there are two suspects who look more promising as to who might have been driving this vehicle. The most likely suspect for the driver is a taxi driver named Lee Van Fan, who was 22 at the time of the crash. He owned a white Fiat Uno, and he was positively identified by a witness. According to his father, Van Than woke his brothers up a few hours after the crash on that night and had them help him paint the Fiat from white to red, and he also replaced the bumper on the car. The police interviewed him for about six hours, but he refused to attend the British inquest, and the police then claimed that they didn't pursue him further because his alibi of being at work had checked out. However, he is believed to have left work early that day. The second suspect for the Fiat driver is a photojournalist named James Anderson, who had been following Diana for weeks, and some people believe that James Anderson was actually an informant for MI6, which is a UK security and intelligence agency. Less than six hours after the crash, he boarded a plane to Corsica in the Mediterranean islands, and this was for a completely unknown reason. His wife provided him with an alibi, but she later uh, retracted that statement. He also painted and sold his Fiat Uno after the crash. He was briefly interviewed by French police, but he was quickly cleared. And in 2000, James Anderson was found in South France in a BMW that had been lit on fire, and his body was so burned that it took a month to identify him positively. A firefighter who reported to the scene said that he had two gunshot wounds in his head, and the official report said that his death was caused by the fire, not by the gunshot wounds, and it was also ruled a suicide. So there's definitely a lot of suspicious questions surrounding James Anderson, because why would someone have committed suicide by lighting themselves on fire? And if he had had gunshot wounds to his head, if those had been fatal, then who set the car on fire? So a lot of people familiar with this case are very perplexed by the issue of James Anderson. Trevor started to remember more about the crash, and he reported that there was a motorcycle that had followed them into the tunnel, and a witness had actually reported seeing the same motorcycle that was driving on the right side of the limo, saying that it cut off on Paul in the tunnel. The witness also said that the driver had walked over to the scene after the crash, holding up his hands in an X before calmly leaving the tunnel. Other witnesses have said that they saw multiple motorcycles, and some people have reported seeing up to five that were present in the tunnel at the time of the crash. And to my knowledge, the actual number of motorcycles in the tunnel that night has never been conclusively confirmed. One of the most frustrating details of this case is that there were 14 CCTV cameras in the tunnel that night, and none of them were working. This detail has been highly scrutinized because somebody actually got a speeding ticket from one of those cameras 15 minutes after the accident occurred, and there is actually no CCTV footage of the limo from the time it left the Ritz until the time of the crash, even though they would have passed a lot of cameras on the way. So returning back to Henri Paul, there has been a lot of speculation that he actually worked for MI6 as an informant and that he was hired to cause the crash. This has been backed up by some weird activity in his finances. In the months before the crash, someone had made direct deposits to him for about £43,000, even though his job only paid £21,000 per year. At the time of his death, he had about £171,000 in his account. So some people think that Henri was instead used to cause the crash without having any personal involvement in it, which tends to make more sense because it's hard to believe that someone would willingly participate in a conspiracy that could be fatal to themselves. But the reason for this is because Henri didn't take a direct route to Dodie's apartment, The road that they usually use had been blocked, so he had to use the tunnel instead of this. And his autopsy showed that in addition to being drunk, he was even taking some prescriptions. 
So he had Prozac and Tiaquid in his system, and that's a drug that's used to treat alcohol withdrawal. Even though his family insists that he wasn't a drinker and that he probably wouldn't have been taking this medication, he also had such a high level of carbon monoxide in his blood that authorities said he should have been unconscious at the time that the crash happened. And the weirdest part about all of this is that witnesses who were with him that night said that they only saw him have two drinks, but in order to reach the alcohol level that he had, he would have had to have at least eight or nine drinks on an empty stomach, and he had eaten dinner that night. So the overall speculation is that his blood test was ultimately switched with someone else's. Trevor said that Henri didn't seem impaired at all, and he further said that if Henri seemed drunk, he never would have let Diana ride in the car that night. Now something to note about the limo itself, it was actually a stolen car that had been bought by a rental company, and it was missing a certain microchip that controlled acceleration, braking, steering, and navigation, so pretty essential functions of a motor vehicle. Additionally, Mercedes, the manufacturer, offered to look at the car for free, but the French police decided that they weren't going to let them do this. Some people believe that the ambulance was also delaying things on purpose to make sure that Diana's injuries were severe enough to have been fatal by the time she reached the hospital. And after her death, she actually wasn't taken to a morgue. She was only placed in an empty room with dry ice and air conditioners and all that. And she was embalmed before any kind of autopsy could be performed on her body. Staff said that they were being pressured by the royal family to make her look as presentable as possible, but it isn't really known the reason for this. However, according to French law, there was certain paperwork that should have been done before she was embalmed that was ultimately filled out after. Richard Tomlinson, who was a former MI6 officer, informed the British inquest that MI6 had been monitoring Diana and that there was an informant working at the hotel in Paris. He also said that in 1992, he was shown plans for an identical accident that was an assassination plot for a Serbian leader, and he said that using bright lights to cause accidents was actually a standard practice for MI6 assassinations. Obviously, this is all anecdotal, so it would be impossible to confirm, but it's definitely important to note. Before she died, Diana was working on a project with the American Red Cross to clear landmines around the world and her death happened to fall just months before the United Nations Landmine Ban Treaty was opened for signatures. This is very important to note in this case because lots of government officials from around the world, including UK officials, wanted to stop this from happening. So there were definitely a lot of people around the world who would have wanted to silence Diana for this reason. Even the United States was keeping an eye on Diana, and in 1999, it was revealed that she had been under surveillance by the National Security Agency and Intelligence Agency under the Department of Defense, and that they had a top-secret file on Diana that was over a thousand pages long, and every single one of those pages are still classified to this day. So besides the theories that her death was intentionally caused by the paparazzi, or that it was intentionally caused by a government agency, the most popular theory by far is that the royal family are the ones that had Diana killed. And to be fair, there was a lot of past conflict between Diana and the royal family. When the divorce was settled, Diana was offered royal security that she turned down because she was very afraid that the royals were going to use it to spy on her. And in the years since the divorce, she was constantly worried about being bugged. After Diana died, her butler, Paul Burrell, came forward with a letter that she had written 10 months after separating from Charles, and in the letter, she said that she was afraid for her life. Quote, my husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for Charles to marry, end quote. And it was because of these fears that Diana was well known to always be wearing a seatbelt, However, for some reason, she wasn't wearing one on that night, and this has never been explained. There has also been speculation that she was pregnant by Dodie, but a test was never done because she was embalmed so quickly. However, there are a lot of people who think this would have been reason enough for the royal family to take her out. 
She had also confided in her lawyer that she was afraid someone was after her and that she was afraid of the royal family. One last thing to note about this theory is that British tradition is the same as in America when people die the flag is raised to half-mast. But this wasn't done for Diana in the immediate aftermath of her death, and the royal family claimed that this was because she had lost her royal title in the divorce. However, the public stood up to her, for her, and the public backlash was really heavy for this, and it still took a week for the royal family to comply and raise the flag to half-mast for Diana. There is a lot of information to unpack in this case, and the unfortunate ending is that we will probably never know what happened that night beyond the official version of events. The speculation will continue, however, and in my opinion there are definitely enough odd inconsistencies and occurrences to warrant all of those questions. Diana's world was much different from the one that most people know, and she was obviously afraid of it in some capacity, and maybe there was a good reason to be. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of the Crime Bistro Podcast. This one in particular is one of my favorite cases to look into, so I hope you all enjoyed it as well. If you want to learn more about this case, all of my sources and some additional media are linked in the show notes at crimebistro.com. And all of that being said, that is going to wrap up this story. So until next time.